Hey, welcome to Family Church Online. We're really glad that you're joining us as we began a new series of messages on 4th of July weekend just a couple weeks ago. We've titled this series Red, White, and Blue. It's a pretty patriotic series talking about the fabric of America and as American flags are waving across the United States, it's a reminder of how blessed we are to live in the land of the free and the home of the brave. So we thought we would look through a biblical perspective of symbolism behind the colors of the American flag. Initially, it didn't have really much meaning behind it, but as the years progressed, the color red began to symbolize valor and bravery or the ultimate sacrifice. The color white is a symbol of purity and innocence, and the color blue symbolizes vigilance or perseverance and justice. Another word for justice is righteousness or moral rightness, which reminds me of a little known hero in the Bible named Josiah. We're gonna talk about Josiah right now because he caught a vision for his country that changed everything. How many of you realize we need a vision for America? We are people hungry for someone to stand up and lead America back to her heritage so that we can sing with conviction that patriotic anthem America the Beautiful. You know the song. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. I would have sung it, but it would have hurt your eardrums. This song is one of the most beloved of the many American patriotic songs that we sing. It's even been proposed as a replacement for the Star Spangled Banner as the national anthem multiple times, but there's seemingly one reason why it hasn't replaced the Star Spangled Banner, and it's because some prefer our national anthem not to refer to any reference of God in America today. Well, Josiah faced the same spiritual and political climate of his day that we're facing even now in America, and it's a fascinating part of history found in the Bible in the book of 2 Kings chapter 21. And it has some very relevant applications to what we're experiencing in our country today. Just a little bit of context about who Josiah was and where he comes from. Josiah's grandfather, his name was Manasseh, and he had been the most wicked king the nation of Judah ever had. The Bible says that Manasseh led the people to be more wicked than the Canaanites who had been vomited out of the land years before because of their sin. And Manasseh completely disregarded God's commandments and lived a life of self-indulgence. He promoted interfaith marriages. He encouraged the worship of other gods, even though it involved human sacrifice. He even sacrificed one of his own infant sons to a foreign god. This man was wicked. And he shed a lot of innocent blood. And for 55 years, Manasseh led the nation in a moral free fall. God had promised his people that if you obey me, you will be blessed. If you forsake me, you will be cursed. Under King David and King Solomon, God's authority was respected. And for over a century, Israel was prosperous and successful. But during Manasseh's leadership, God was totally rejected. And the nation was divided and there was widespread violence and moral chaos. And when Manasseh finally died, his son Ammon became king, but he was just as bad. After only two years as king king of Judah, Ammon was assassinated by some of his own officials. And that's when Josiah was crowned king. And here's the amazing thing about Josiah. Josiah was only eight years old when he was crowned king over Judah. Imagine that an eight-year-old king over a nation of people. You would think with his family history and lack of experience that Josiah would be a disaster, but he was surrounded with good advisors, and young Josiah had a heart for God. He became one of Judah's best kings and led a campaign to clean up the country. And the Bible says this in 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 2, He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and followed completely the ways of his father David, not turning aside to the right or to the left. When he was still a young man, Josiah ordered the temple to be refurbished. The house of God had been totally neglected under his grandfather. In fact, it had been used as a hub of idol worship and prostitution. So Josiah ordered that it be renovated. And while working on that reconstruction project, one of the priests discovered an ancient scroll hidden away in in a dusty closet. And it was a copy of the scriptures that no one had paid attention to for decades. 
And this book of the law was found, the Bible, the scripture, was read to Josiah, and he recognized it as the word of God. He tore his robe in reverence, and he cried out, Lord, we've not obeyed these commands. What's going to happen to us? And God answered through a prophet, Tess, named Huldah, that since Judah had become so wicked, it was his plan that the nation would be destroyed. So Josiah took immediate action to try to prevent that from happening. And he ordered all of the people of Judah to gather at the temple to listen to the word of God and then to go home and obey it. And then Josiah ordered that all the idols and the equipment used for worshiping false gods would be taken outside the city and burned. He cut down all the Asherah poles, which were kind of the sexually oriented businesses of, of his day. He tore down the houses of prostitution and executed the old priests who were the leaders of false worship. I mean, he went to extreme lengths to make sure that God was at the center of everything. And then Josiah reinstituted the priesthood in the observance of the Passover. And the Bible tells us this in 2 Kings chapter 23, verses 24 through 25. It says, Josiah also got rid of the mediums and psychics, the household gods, the idols, and every other kind of detestable practice, both in Jerusalem and throughout the land of Judah. And he did this in obedience to the laws written in the scroll that Hilkiah the priest had found in the Lord's temple. Never before had there been a king like Josiah who turned the lo to the Lord with all his heart and soul and strength, obeying all the laws of Moses. And there has never been a king like him since. So because of King Josiah's repentance, God gave the nation of Judah a reprieve from judgment. God had mercy on them. God told Josiah, because your heart was responsive and you humbled yourself before the Lord, and because you tore your robes and wept in my presence, your eyes will not see all the disaster I'm going to bring on this place. So Josiah reigned for 31 years over Judah, and the nation thrived under his leadership. So with the time that remains, I just want to look at some of the obvious lessons that we can take away from this biblical account. An obvious lesson from that account is this, number one, that godly leadership makes the difference. There is a direct correlation between the morality of a nation and its stability. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34, it says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. We need godly men and women to lead their homes. We need godly leaders in government. We need godly leaders in the church. We need godly leaders in the workplace. Godly leadership makes the difference. And Josiah helped the nation of Judah reclaim its spiritual heritage. You know, when D Josiah died, there was a moral drift that resumed after his death. And a few years later, the Babylonians conquered Israel and took the citizens captive. And I believe the United States of America has been a, a blessed nation because it has a godly foundation. The reason we are the most wealthy, most free, most secure, most envied nation on the earth is that we were established as a nation under God, and God has kept his promise to bless us. But let me give a brief overview of our spiritual history. Let's go back in time a little bit. In 1620, the, the pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock, and they signed a document known as the Mayflower Compact, that goes like this. Having undertaken the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. Our, that's what it says. Our forefathers came here for the purpose of advancing the Christian faith. Here's another important event in our country's history. The first college established on American soil was in Boston on September 26, the year 1636. It's known as the Rules and Precepts of Harvard, and it reads less way. It says, Let every student be plainly instructed. The main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. Wow, that's what was written. In 1776, the, the colonists declared independence from Great Britain. The Declaration of Independence began. And it says this, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are endowed by their Creator, with certain inalienable rights. The rights did not emanate from government, but from God. You know, none of our founders were perfect, and of course, the, not all were Christians. Some, at, such as Thomas Jefferson, they were, he was a deist, and a few like Thomas Paine, they were skeptics. But the vast majority were believers in Jesus Christ, and they respected the Bible as the ultimate source of authority. In fact, 52 of the 55 signers of the Declaration of Independence were, 
were Christians. 27 were seminary graduates. And so just after signing the Declaration of Independence, Samuel Adams, the man, not the beer, he said this. He said, we have this day restored the sovereign to whom atoned men ought to be obedient. He reigns in heaven, and from the rising to the setting sun may his kingdom come. George Washington, our first president, said in his inaugural address, he said this, the propitious smiles of heaven can never be expected on our nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right which heaven itself has ordained. John Quincy Adams, our sixth president, said the highest glory of the American Revolution was this. It connected in one indissoluble bond the principles of government with the principles of Christianity. From the day of the Declaration, they, the American people, were bound by the laws of God, which they all, and by the laws of the gospel, which they nearly all acknowledged as the rules of their conduct. In the early 1900s, I mean, this, we're going down history lane here. President Woodrow Wilson said, A nation which does not remember what it was yesterday does not know what it is today, nor what it is trying to do. You see, America was born a Christian nation. America was born to exemplify that devotion to the elements of righteousness which are derived from the revelations of the Holy Scriptures. The, the U.S. Supreme Court decreed in 1930, We are a Christian nation. In 1952, in 1952, the court stated, we are a religious people whose institutions presuppose a supreme being. I mean, that's why scriptures are etched on the walls of many national buildings and monuments. That's why all of our currency, our money, has stamped on it, in God we trust. That's why the Pledge of Allegiance includes the phrase, under God. America has a godly foundation. And that Christian foundation has given America moral values that provide a common consensus of right and wrong, like the sanctity of life, the structure of marriage and family, the love and protection of children, the inerrant value that of every person. Every person has a value, the need for integrity and civility in relationships, the respect for people and authority, the pursuit of justice for all, mercy for the oppressed, the restraint of evil desires, the right to own property and enjoy individual freedom are all values rooted in the Bible, the Word of God. And with those biblical principles at our base, the United States of America became the most powerful and influential nation in the world. But there is now a bitter division that exists in America, and we're involved in an intensifying cultural war every single day. On one side, our those of us who stand for traditional biblical values and on the other side are those who mock God and ridicule the Bible and call for total freedom to live as we, to live as we please with no regard to the consequences that they imply. The King Manasseh of our era are attempting to discredit the teaching of the Bible and eliminate any accountability to God. The enemies of God are willing to ridicule Christians, rewrite history, sandblast the scripture off the walls, redesign city seals to erase the cross, and change the pledge to remove any mention of God. In other words, in our culture today, we want to be our own God. But if there is no creator, no validity, no validity to the Bible, then there is no foundation for right and wrong, and the result is national confusion and chaos, and that's what we're seeing today. And so again, I want to remind you, the Bible tells us this in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34. We just read it. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. For example, if you neglect maintenance to your car, it takes a while for the engine to become so polluted that it begins to break down. And if a nation neglects its moral values, it takes a while for the complete collapse to occur, but it's inevitable. Arnold Toynbee, a respected historian, wrote that of the 22 major civilizations in, his, in history, 19 collapsed from within. That was written before the fall of the Soviet Union, and we are not exempt either. Another man, Jedediah Morse, one of the, our founding fathers, predicted over 200 years ago, he said this, whenever the pillars of Christianity shall be overthrown, our present Republican forms of government and all blessings which flow from them must fall with them. 
That's why the decline in moral values and the hostility against Christianity is so disturbing. I mean, we sense we're getting dangerously close to the precipice of anarchy. We have activist judges who have declared that marriage is no longer defined by God, it's defined by them. Therefore, two men and two women can be married. And when judges arbitrarily disregard law and cast aside 3,500 years of Judeo-Christian tradition, the stage is set for anarchy. I mean, no society ever lasts long without a moral consensus. And now we're witnessing a nationwide breakdown of the family, chaos in schools, mistrust of politicians, overcrowded courtrooms and jails, which are all indications of a society beginning to come unraveled. And one of the arguments of the pluralists of our day is that since we have become such a diverse society, it's intolerant to continue to impose Christian, Christian morality on others. It's too narrow-minded, people say. But Patrick Henry wrote over 200 years ago, he said, it cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And for this very reason, people of other faiths have been afforded asylum, prosperity, and freedom of worship here. And the unwritten understanding with people of other cultures has been that you are free to live and practice your religious traditions and you are to be treated with respect. But understand that the moral foundation of, the, of this nation is Christian. We are still one nation under God. And there's another lesson that we learn from Josiah in the book of 2 Kings in the Bible. In order for us to become America the beautiful, once again, number two, America must turn back to God. I think Abraham Lincoln answered it well when he said, We've forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. I think President Lincoln was right. We've forgotten God. And it's even truer today than it was when he made that proclamation in 1863. We've tried to push God out of the classroom. We've tried to push God out of the courtroom. And for all practical purposes, we've tried to push God out of our culture. And the question is, will good ever prevail over evil? Or are we simply just doomed to failure? And I think the answer to America's problem is not political. It's spiritual. We need to turn back to God, just as Josiah turned his nation back towards God. And we can't wait for the masses to respond to God. Each of us have a responsibility to live a life that honors God. It starts with you and me. Edmund Burke, he said, All that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. So one person having the courage to obey God's leading can turn a nation around. For God, will you be the one? It happened to the nation of Judah under Josiah. It happened in the city of Nineveh with the prophet Jonah. It happened in America in what is called the Great Awakening in the early days of the frontier when people turned to God by the thousands. The atmosphere is perfect for a spiritual awakening in America. A lot of people are fed up with activists, political correctness, and just a lack of decency that exists in our nation right now. And finally, in order for us to become America the Beautiful once again, we must, number three, never underestimate the next generation. Our young people have an opportunity to write history. Josiah was eight years old when God raised him up into leadership. He was in his 20s when he led a spiritual revival. If we're going to reclaim the beauty of America, then leadership needs to come from some courageous young people, young people with clear conviction and creativity and courageous energy. And the cause of Christ needs young people who understand the critical times we're living in and are willing to pledge their lives to reclaim the values that made America so beautiful. The, the people pass a law against partial birth abortion. A district judge overturns it. Our representatives pass a law disallowing gay marriage. A liberal judge overturns it. We pass a law attempting to protect children from internet exploitation. The Supreme Court overturns it. I mean, there is an attack on the family and the Bible without representation. And we need young people who understand the times and are perceptive enough to know what should be done and who have the courage to do it. You know, surprisingly, when young people step up to lead, uh, to take the lead, 
the older people will follow, though the opposite is not always true. So we can no longer sit on the sidelines and be neutral. So what can we do? Well, here's what we can do. We can repent and pray. The Bible tells us this in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. It ought to be our theme verse. Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. We need to pray every day for America and for our leaders and seek to live repentant, righteous lives. Let's be faithful to our families, pure in our thoughts, honest in our business dealings, wise stewards of our money, appropriate in our language and the way that we talk. And understand that to experience revival and renewal, we don't have to turn the entire nation to God, just a few people at a time. You know, God has often blessed the people through a small remnant of righteous followers. God blessed Laban's family because of Jacob. God blessed Egypt because of the presence of Joseph. God blessed Babylon because of Daniel. God will bless America for a repentant, righteous remnant. We can make a difference if, like Josiah, when we serve God with all of our hearts, strength, and souls, what can we do? We, well, we can repent and pray, and we can be informed about the issues. We've got to be people who are informed enough to engage in intelligent debate and discussion. We must vote and vote values. The Bible says the Christian is to honor the king, which means we're to respect our government. And in America's government system, that means we vote. And so when we vote, we vote values, not party. Don't vote because someone is a Democrat or a Republican or they make a nice appearance. Find out about the people you vote for and vote for those who share traditional values. Live your Christian life out loud. Don't be a closet believer. We can't just retreat into our little bunkers and sing Christian songs and hear inspirational sermons. We are under the great commission of Jesus Christ to be the salt of the earth and to go into all the world with the gospel. We are commissioned to go into all the world and share the good news of Jesus Christ. Teachers, college students, businessmen and businesswomen speak up with boldness. The scripture promises that in the end, God is going to have the victory. We know how the story ends. And the Bible tells us that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord in Philippians chapter 2, verse 10. And so the truth of the gospel has to become more powerful than the appeal of the world. The magnetism of Jesus Christ has to become more dynamic than the menaces of this world. Then perhaps one day we'll be able to say with confidence again, this one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. And we'll continue to raise the banner high and proclaim with confidence, America the beautiful. If there's one thing that I hope you heard in this message is this, the answer is Jesus Christ. If you're looking for a solid foundation to build your life upon, the answer is Jesus. If you're confused and searching for purpose and hope, the answer is Jesus. If you're looking for love and you've looked in all the wrong places, well, it sounds like a song. The answer is Jesus. He loves you. And maybe you're watching this and you need to receive the love and grace of Jesus Christ. And if you like forgiveness of sin and eternity in heaven, today is the day of salvation. I'd love to lead you in this prayer for you to make this your prayer wherever you're watching. Just pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God, that you left heaven to live on earth. Fully God and also fully man, you were born of a virgin, you lived a perfect life. Although you were tempted, you never sinned. You were perfect, blameless sacrifice. And Jesus, you died on the cross for the sins of the world and for me. And you were raised to new life again. And right now I ask you to forgive me. I receive you by faith. And from this day forward, I'm inviting you to have your way in me. I give you my life, Jesus. Change me from the inside out. Make me more like you every day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you just pray that prayer, we're so proud of you. In fact, we want to help you grow. Let us know that you made that decision to follow Jesus Christ. If you just asked him into your heart and made that decision to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, click the link so that we can connect with you and help you grow in your new relationship with God. Have an incredible week. I'm so glad you tuned in.